You are listening to Information and Inspiration with Jen Julius, helping you take control of your own life by finding clarity, improving your communication, and building confidence to achieve your goals. For more information about me and my guest, you can go to jenjulius.com and check out the On the Radio tab. Today, I am so excited to have Dr. Ivan Meisner on the show, and we're going to be discussing a few things, actually. We're going to be discussing authentic networking. We're going to be discussing a little bit about um, BNI. For those of you that don't know, you will hear where that came from. And then we have a little bit of a surprise for you. So we have a few things up our sleeve, but I'd like to start off by asking Ivan and also saying thank you so much for making the time to be here, but... Tell us a little bit about who you are, where you came from, and why you're so awesome. <laughs> that's a, that's a, an interesting question. Yeah, I've done lots of interviews, Jim, but nobody's ever asked uh, that question to open up with. <laughs> Good. <laughs> um, so I was actually born on the East Coast, or, or near the East Coast. I was born in uh, Pennsylvania and uh, moved out to California when I was really young. Grew up in California um, um, and uh, grew up in a very, very humble uh, setting. I mean, we were low-income family, but uh, you know, great parents. Um, and uh, started my business in Southern California, and and the business has now grown to um, seventy-three countries around the world. Uh, it's uh, it's it's really become uh, my life. Uh, BNI, the, the referral organization. Um, it, it's uh, you know, we're helping to change the way the world does business by building relationships with people all around the world. I, as why am I awesome? You know, I think <laughs> <laughs> that was the hardest. I was trying to hold off from that one because I I, I I don't quite know how to answer that other than I think I think my that my my strength is a collaboration. Mm. Um, that's what I try to get people to do is to work together to collaborate. I really believe that the sum of the whole is greater than the individual parts. Yes. That when people get together and they. They can work through problems, actually talk to one another, uh, and collaborate. That magic can happen, mm. and I see that every single day. Um, and I've seen it for thirty-two years with BNI. That working together just uh, achieves so much more. And I think that's probably what I have brought to the world is is a, uh, an ability to help people collaborate. I love it. And I love that you brought up that the sum is greater than the individual parts, right? Because so often we forget that. And when we are collaborating, that's when so much more possibility is possible, right? Yeah, I have, no, no question about it. I mean, you know, in, in the context of the organization I started, it's, it's about referrals. And I look at a room full of 30 people, who, you know, how many referrals are they going to give each other if they didn't get together on a regular basis? And it'd be minuscule. But when you get these people together and they're talking and Building relationships, and that's the key, building relationships, then all of a sudden they generate tons of business. Um, it's just it's exciting to see. So collaboration is the key for me. I really appreciate, too, the emphasis on relationships. Um, so for those of you that don't know what BNI is, it's Business Networking International, and Ivan's actually the founder <clears throat> of that organization. It's an international organization that I've been a part of for four years. And... It's interesting because when I joined, I wanted to join for personal and professional reasons. Like, yeah, I wanted to grow my business, but I also knew I had to make some changes in my personal relationships, too, if I wanted to be successful. And to be honest, if I wanted to kind of not only be successful in business, but in my industry, because I'm in the personal growth industry, and I wasn't necessarily running my own life very well at the time. <laughs> mm. And relationships, the relationships I built in, at least in my chapter, Ended up, I, I kind of, it sounds dramatic, but in a way I really say they saved my life because I ended up going through a major, major life change eight months into my BNI journey and was asked to step into presidency. And the relationships as my, I felt like my life was falling apart or what really kept me going and made it so I didn't leave my business and I didn't walk away and I didn't give up. And that's where it really came to show like relationships are what matter. Like authentic relationships are so critical to our success in every capacity, right? They they really are in every capacity. Uh, if um, if you can't work with someone and trust someone, um, you know these are probably not somebody that you want to spend time with. Um, I have a book that I've done just for BNI, but we're going to be we're going to be uh, releasing it globally. Uh, and I don't know if you you're familiar with the the material, but it's called Who's in Your Room. Have you heard me talk about that? Jane? I have a little bit. Yeah. Why don't you touch on that though? Because I think that fits exactly what you're talking yeah. about here. The whole idea with this with this book 
which we're hoping comes out to the public in 2017, uh, is imagine you live your entire life in one room. Mm -hmm. And that one room has only one door. And that one door is an enter-only door. So that when people come into your room or into your life, they're there forever. <laughs> yep. You can never get them out. Yeah. Now, luckily, it's a metaphor. But when I'm talking to audiences, I, I say, but if it were true, would you be more selective about the people that you let into your room? Right. right. And almost everybody always says, Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I say, okay, so why not be more selective now? Because I would argue that, in fact, they are, in, in a way, no matter what, in your life forever. Yeah. Because, and we're not talking about just family members, that, no matter what, they're going to be in your life. I would argue that most people that you really like close to you end up being in your life, even when they're, when they're physically out of your room or out of your life, they're still emotionally in there. And, and here's, here's what I mean. We've all had experiences where there was somebody who was close to us and did something that was very hurtful, that you were just shocked about. And, and you no longer have a relationship with them, but they may be out of your room, but they're in your head forever. Everything you do or say in the future will be tainted by that relationship. Now, it can be both good and bad. You can have a great relationship, and because of that, uh, that person may not be in your physical life anymore, but yet um, you, know, you, 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 you move forward with them in your head, and that can be positive, but it can also be negative. Yeah. And so I would argue that you've got to be selective about the people you let in your life because the quality of your room depends on the people in your room. I'm so grateful that you touched on that because this is actually a topic that I touch on on the show a lot, um, a little bit more from what I what I would call the energetic standpoint. And so the, the concept of how the people that we have relationships with, it's like we have little energy connections to, like I call them little like cords, like there's little cords that connect us. And if we have all these energy cords running to all these people, first of all, that can be really exhausting, right? If we're not maintaining that, we're not really being conscientious of like what those cords look like and what the connections look like, right? Like, is the cord all frayed and crazy and screwed up and about ready to electrocute us, <laughs> right? Yeah. But then also how, how are we then when those people are no longer physically present, there's still the concept that those cords can still be connected. And I actually was just, I have another interview on my site talking about energetic hygiene, how like being conscientious of really being mindful of when we're connecting with people consciously, like a client practitioner relationship, right? Like in my industry or even in a, a intimate a lover relationship or even in a friendship how are we maintaining that connection or also cleaning it up if needed or releasing it if needed, right? And we can even have cords to memories like mm -hmm. you kind of mentioned mm -hmm. to past events and really being mindful like, wow, what what is still affecting me and how can I take responsibility to potentially clean some of that up? Maybe do some forgiveness work or take some responsibility in some way to shift how certain events in my life might still be affecting me. Yeah. Y yes. And, you know, oftentimes we repeat behaviors. We keep bringing people into our life or into our room that have the same kind of challenges that That's right. um, that um, we didn't like for, with someone else. For me, you know, uh, it hit me that I was doing that in one very particular area, and that was um, people with drama. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I hate drama. I don't. I'm not drawn to drama, but I kept, for whatever reason, because somebody had a skill set, where, and that was usually the case. They had a skill set that I needed to work with, wanted to work with, and so I would work with them, and, and I knew they had drama, and I knew they came to the table with drama. Yeah. And one in particular was like, hey, yeah, I know, I know this guy's got a lot of drama, and he always, but, but I can deal with it. And I brought him in to a, a project, got very close to him, and, and I knew he had this drama, and I thought I could deal with it. And then I realized, wait a minute. I, I'm struggling with this. I am dealing with it. I'm struggling with it. But nobody else is dealing with it well. I mean, very few people. And, and so he's actually ruining the relationships that I have with other people. Yeah. And, 
And so I cut them loose. I cut them loose from the project, and all of a sudden things started to turn around. And, and so it's very important that you have an understanding of what your values are. That's right. And this is, this is the core to the concept of who's in your room. What are your values? And then what you need to do is have sort of a guardian in your mind, it's your conscious and subconscious mind that, that then screens people based on those values. Is this the kind of person that I want to work with, that I want to have a relationship with, and do their values blend with mine? They don't have to be the same values, but they can't be completely incongruent. Because if they're incongruent, then you're just going to have conflict. Oh, I'm jumping out of my seat right now. This is... You didn't. I feel like you are just speaking to my heart <laughs> because this is one of the primary areas I coach on is value alignment and understanding how your values correlate to your triggers and really mastering your emotional reactions. And values are so critical to all relationships, right? Uh, right? Intimate partnerships, business relationships, friendships. And one thing I've noticed, right, is like, especially when we get clear on our core values, we start to really see not only the people that we're attracted to typically hold similar values, as you mentioned, but the things that really trigger us and really make us mad are mm-hmm. often because they're a direct violation of one of our core values. So, yeah, but we don't think about it before we go into, that's right. um, into a relationship. We right. just I don't know. We well, just walk into us these relationships about it, right? <laughs> yeah. Business and professional. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And you're I just I mean, love, a, love, a love personal it. and business. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, and <laughs> let's be honest, like how often does that end up getting intertwined too, you know? Yeah, exactly. When you're, I mean, for me, so much of the type of relationships I build authentically in my industry, and that's another thing, as we talk about authentic networking, it's, I feel like there's a difference, and I'd love to hear your input about just the difference of authentic networking, perhaps in different industries too, because when it's a industry where it's like, okay, I wrecked my car, I'll take it to an auto body shop. That makes sense, right? It's like, I'm going to get my car fixed. But Mm -hmm. when it comes to like being in the personal growth realm, it's like, whoa, there's so many options. How do I find the right fit? What type of coach or healer or whatever do I need? And I feel like the way that people might market themselves or network needs to be a little different. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I I think what we're talking about is referrals, basically. You know, uh, for me, it's about referrals. It's about going to somebody and asking someone, do you know... Do you know somebody who can do this? Because I, I don't pick people off the Internet. I don't pick people uh, off of an advertisement. Uh, I 99% of the business I do is through referral. And, you know, some people might say, well, you, look, you, you're on the world. And I don't think we've really talked about what PNI is. So let me put it in context. PNI is a referral organization. We get people together every week, and they pass each other referrals. So people say, well, you, you run the world's largest referral organization or business network, so of course you would do that. I did that before I started BNI. As a matter of fact, that's, yeah. what, that's what gravitated me towards creating something like BNI because I really believed that I wanted to do business with people that, that uh, I could trust going into it. Now, then to answer your question, when you give a referral, you give a little bit of your reputation away. That's right. If you give a good referral, it enhances your reputation, but if you give a bad referral, it hurts your reputation. So it's very important to have relationships with people who you trust who will refer you to people they trust. And then when you do that, the chances of working with someone that is not going to do a good job goes down dramatically. Yeah. 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 Yes. And I'm just thinking, I went back to the idea of, like, who's in your room, too. (laughs) Yeah. Right. Right. And, and, you know, you you... you become the people you hang out with. Yeah. And if you hang out with quality business professionals, honest, they're ethical, they're fun, they're interesting, then chances are really good. Those are the kinds of people that they're hanging out with. And so, you, you, you know, you can feel comfortable that the kinds of business that you're going to get, the kind of referrals you're going to get, are going to be quality. That's right. Well, and I I guess it's a little bragging point for my local chapter, but we have been a little bit on the smaller side for about pretty much since I was president, actually. (laughs) Ironically, we lost about 30% of the chapter, but it was time for some cleanup. You know how that goes. And uh, we've remained fairly small, averaging about 2021, and we still closed a million dollars in business this last year. And I really attribute that to the depth of relationships that we have in that specific chapter. Like we have a lot of people that have been in for five, eight, ten years. We have people that just really care and 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 
love each other I want to say you know like it's more than just like oh yeah you're a good whatchamacallit or whatever you do it's right. like no I care about you and I care about your success and I trust you and I know you care about me and this is how we support each other right so yeah I, I, I agree it's really all about relationships um, yeah. I think that when you, when it comes to networking people think of networking and, and there's a lot of people who who don't like it, but I think it's because they're, they're seeing it done wrong. Um, networking, oftentimes people use networking like a face-to-face cold calling opportunity. Right. Hi, Jen, my name is Ivan. Let's do business. Yeah. And they jump right into trying to sell. Yeah. Uh, I did a, an event a few years ago in London, and we had, um, oh, we had a thousand people in the audience, and I was a um, keynote speaker, and I, I stood up and I said, how many of you here today, raise your hands, are hoping to, you know, just maybe possibly sell something. Jen, a thousand people raised their hands. <laughs> yeah, everybody raised their hands. I said, great, thank you. Second question. How many of you are here today hoping to, you know, maybe just possibly buy something? No one raised their hand. Wow. Not one single person. This is what I call the networking disconnect. People yeah. show up at networking events wanting to sell, but nobody's there to buy. Yeah. And that's why when you go to a networking event, sometimes people go to a networking event, they come back, and they want to get a shower. <laughs> yeah. Right? Because yeah. they've been slimed. It's like everybody's <laughs> trying to sell to them. Right. That is not authentic networking. Yeah. To me, networking is about building relationships with other business professionals. So people say, well, why, why go to a networking event then? Well, you go to a networking event for to, to move through what I call the VCP process, which is the core of everything that I teach, stands for visibility, credibility, profitability. First, you have to be visible in the community. So you go to networking events so people know who you are. That's right. But then you keep going back to build credibility. So people know who you are, they know what you do, they know you're really good at it. And then you want to make regular touch points with the people who you've built credibility with so that you can refer them and they can refer you, and that takes you to profitability. And that process takes time. You can't do it in a week, in a month, in six months. You're talking about nine months, a year, maybe a little more, depending on the profession you're in. And so that's, to me, what relationship networking is all about. Yes, yes, yes. And I really, I'm so glad you brought up visibility, credibility, and profitability. I had um, Mike Macedonio on the show, I think, a year or two ago, and I think we touched on that, too. And it's such a perfect and simple way to really clarify how a lot of referral relationships can be built in a really simple, clear way and how to keep a really simple structure in your mind around the steps to profitability, right? If people don't know who you are, how are they going to refer you? And if they don't trust you, how are they going to refer you? And you have to really build those things before you expect to start making money and getting business, right? Yeah, that's very true. And you you mentioned Mike. Mike's a good friend, uh, a partner with me in a company called Ascentive and my co-author in um, World's Best Known Marketing Secret where we talk about VCP. Yeah, yes, yes. You guys have just you guys are both so great at really breaking some of these things down. So thank you for that. Yeah. So okay, awesome. So anything else that you really want to share about authentic networking because I know that we also have something up our sleeve that we want to transition <laughs> to that's connected but a little different. Yeah, you know what? Um I I, I think the the most important thing that uh, I could tell your listeners about networking <clears throat> is that networking is more about farming than it is about hunting, that it's about cultivating relationships with other business professionals. It's not a get-rich-quick scheme. Right. It's a way to build a solid foundation for a long-term successful business. And, and I understand why a lot of people don't really do it well. Uh, and, and oftentimes people who do think they do it well don't because they're, they're basically just doing that face-to-face cold calling. They're trying to sell. We don't, I think people struggle with this because we don't teach it in colleges and universities anywhere in the world. It's just not taught. That's right. And so what happens is people just meet each other. They go into sales mode instead of relationship building mode. And I think one of the most important things I've I've learned in the last 32 years of running the world's largest network is that it's not what you know or who you know. You know the expression, it's not what you know, it's who you know. Yeah. It's not what you know or who you know. It's how well you know each other. Yeah. It really counts. It's about going deep and building that relationship. That's when you're going to build a powerful personal network. 
Well, and I feel like I need to get on my soapbox for a second about authentic relationships because I was also I was actually on a panel about authentic relationships last year, <clears throat> and it was it was very fascinating because the four people that were on the panel, two of them were coaches, and it was me and another one of my coach friends, and then the other two were more in like the actual like really mainstream business realm. And our approaches around authentic networking were quite different. And one thing that I kind of took away from that was. I'm trying to trying to stay PC, but whatever. <laughs> Being really real about building relationships. And when we say building relationships, what we're not talking about is still going in with an alter an ulterior motive, right? Like, oh, I'm right. gonna tell this person that I like them and then buy them coffee and then do this because really I want to get them to buy this thing for me in a month. And if I spend right. a month getting to know them, then maybe I can sell them this. No, no, no. We're also saying, like, if you're building relationships, again, who's in your room? Who do you want to be building relationships with? Who do you right. want to be allowing yourself to connect with energetically, right? And share that relationship with. Thinking of it as, like, a sacred component of your life. If you're building a relationship with someone, you're allowing them in your space, like you said, right? Yep. And really being clear, like, if you don't vibe with someone, you don't have to. Don't force it, right? Go find yeah, someone and- that you want to build a relationship with <laughs> because that's going to be a lot more fun and a lot easier and a lot more productive probably, right? It is. And, and if you're you know, meeting with that person and taking them out for coffee just so that you can make a sale, that's very short-sighted. Yeah. Instead, what you want to do is you know, build a relationship with, with this individual or with, or with people so that they know you, like you, and trust you. That's right. And when that happens, then they're going to refer you. And this is the farming mentality because if, if, if I'm – if I'm hunting for my business, I basically get to eat what I kill that day. That's it. That's right. But when you're farming, it, you, you reap bushels of food. You could, you could go on vacation and, and the food is still growing. The, the relationships are out there uh, or the referrals are still being gathered for you. Yep. And so uh, this is what I mean by networking is more about farming than it is about hunting. It's, it's really about building those relationships so you get referrals, not just closed sales. Right, right. And then it continues and continues and develops, etc. Exactly. Because then also we have to keep in mind that when I, so it, one of the ways that um, B and I, what Ivan and I have mentioned a few times is, works is that when we give referrals, we also track them so we can thank the person that gave us the business. And I'm kind of known as like the the crazy one about uh, tracking far, 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 far out. So I am known in my chapter to do tier five referrals, which means someone referred me, the person they referred me, then referred me, then that person referred me, then that person referred me, right? So it keeps going out. And that's what else we have to keep in mind is when we're building really deep, authentic relationships, the impact and the trickle effect is profound, right? So why not find someone and I had an interview with my marketing coach a couple years ago, um, too, and she really nailed it. She said, find the people that you really like to do things with, like that you actually want to be around and do it with and whatever, right? Like we, we got a little silly about it and really emphasized, find the people that you just feel like, oh, I love you and you love me and here we go. And it just has that beautiful exchange because those are the relationships that are going to go deep and that are going to be sustainable and that could end up bringing referral yeah. after referral, multiple people down the road, right? Right. Now, you've used an expression a couple of times that uh, a lot of business people wouldn't use with business. And that is, you know, you love me, I love you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, but let's talk about that for a moment because it, it just jumped out at me. I have a good friend, Steve Barber, um, who uh, does a lot of um, uh, consulting work. And I, I went to, uh, I'm a member of an organization called TLC, the Transformational Leadership Council, which was started by Jack Canfield. And, and sometimes some of their sessions are a little airy fairy, you know, a little sure. new AG for me. And there was one that was run by Steve called um, Love in Business. Mm. And I thought, really, Steve, you're a, you know, you're a really straightforward business guy, and you're going to do a session on love and business. But I really respected Steve, so I showed up. Oh, it was awesome. Yeah. It was absolutely awesome. And he talked about the fact that, hey, you know what? People love in business all the time. And he showed a slide that was just, it was, it, 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 it was perfect. It was a quote from one of his clients who is in the IT business. And he worked, with, I, he worked with technicians who go out and service uh, uh, corporate clients. And the manager said to his, his IT key, he says, I tell my 
my IT guys, build a relationship with your customers. Build such a good relationship that they love you, mm-hmm. that they want to take you home and meet the spouse, love you, mm-hmm. so that they have such a great relationship with you that if you accidentally explode their machine, they'll look at you and say, oh, well, things happen. It's okay. <laughs> That kind of love you. Yeah. He said, if you do that, then you're going you're gonna to have a relationship with clients that will last a lifetime because they trust you and they understand mistakes happen. And, you can, and they'll give you some grace when you have problems. So, I mean, when I heard that, it was like, oh, my goodness, I get this. There can be love in business. It's not yeah. as new agey as it sounds. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and again, I think it also goes um, like the the way that that might show up is going to be quite different in different industries, right? So true. recognizing that and the the way that that might show up, but it's so true. And I think that that's and I'll I'll go on my new agey soapbox for a second before uh, <laughs> we break for a moment. But I think what the world is craving right now is more of that love energy, right? Like more of that really genuine connection, because that's really what I break love down to is it's genuine connection in different capacities, right? And so it can be love between family members, friends, partners, whatever. But I, I just love to love. And I really feel like I have a deep seated love for so many of the people in my chapter, in my BNI chapter, and so many of the people in my network, and so many, and my clients. I mean, I'm in the personal growth industry. There's a lot of trust that needs to be built, and with trust often comes deep seated emotional connection, right? Yeah. And I think that our, our culture is craving love. It's craving genuine connection. And Tony Robbins, I mean, he talks about love, safety, and belonging, right? The three primary things that we crave as humans. And I see Mm -hmm. that over and over and over again, Ivan, right? And so what we're talking about with authentic networking, we're talking about creating that sense of belonging, right? We're creating that sense of safety of like, oh, I can trust this person. Like we talked about with VCP, visibility, credibility, profitability, right? And then we bring in that love component, which might seem like, but it's exactly what we just talked about. It's like, no, like having that relationship where we do have that deep seated care for, uh, compassion for connection to, right. And that's where we're really embracing in, in my opinion, the whole human, right. Yes. And, and it makes sales way less mercenary. Yeah. It makes it relational, uh, and, and, and not transactional. And so, uh, it's one of the things I love about networking and, and building your business through networking is that it's not a transactional process. It's a, it's a relational process. With that, I, uh, I'm curious because I think that that's going to be the perfect segue to uh, the concept of a relational process and how we're going to transition into an authentic health standpoint too. Authentic networking authentic health. We're talking about authenticity a lot today. And you and I were chatting earlier and we're like, you know what? Let's get a little crazy. Let's go. Let's go a little bit off the beaten path today because that's what I typically do anyways on my show. I would love to hear about some of your journey in the last few years around your, your building of a new authentic health pathway because you've had You've had some stuff. You've had some stuff. So I'm going to throw it over to you and let you share what feels right and true for you today. Yeah, you know, it's, so it's, I'm sure people are wondering how does health uh, fit with networking. But, uh, I mean, I can tell you how pretty, pretty easily, if your health is affected, you can't do business, uh, not do business uh, at, at 100%. That's right. And so, um, you know, health is a, obviously a, an important aspect of, uh, of your life. And... Um, I wrote an article that started getting me to write about about health. I uh, wrote an article a few years ago about uh, the C word in the C suite and how um, an executive or an entrepreneur handles uh, cancer when you're running a, a company. So, about almost five years ago now, I was diagnosed with uh, prostate cancer. And um, I was told that I had six months to make a decision on what kind of surgery. So it wasn't a real fast-growing mm-hmm. type of cancer, but but there's no question about it. I had six months, and I needed to do my research to pick out what kind of surgery or uh, radiation, chemotherapy, what, what it was I needed to do or wanted to do. And uh, i got to tell you, I was, a, I was a very much a Western medicine kind of guy uh, and... Uh, this holistic uh, medicine was voodoo, mm-hmm. and my my wife, God bless her, she uh, 
she had a completely different position on that. And, um, and so she kind of talked me into trying something out uh, on an interim basis because I had six months to decide what, what I wanted to do. Um, and she said, look, what do you got to lose? Let me take you to a, to a center. We went to a center for advanced medicine um, in California. And, and she said, it, they're a holistic approach. And the worst thing that will happen is you'll be in a healthier place when you go do surgery. Yeah, sure. So I'm like, eh, that's a good point. So I, I did. I went, and it was, uh, and I was all in. I didn't, you know, I didn't cut corners. And the funniest thing started happening. My numbers, my uh, markers uh, for cancer started uh, going down. Mm. First they plateaued, then they went down. And then the MRIs or the uh, the high definition uh, ultrasounds I was doing uh, showed the lesions fading. And the medical doctors kept saying, they'd look at they'd look at my paper, right? They'd they'd be looking at it and they'd go, "What? What are you doing?" Yeah, yeah. And I would tell them what I'm doing, and they're like, "Yeah, okay. What else are you doing?" Yeah. And and really, at that point, all I was doing was I, I changed my diet, changed mm-hmm. my diet drastically. Yeah. From and I wasn't a junk food guy. I mean, I did eat too much sugar, mm-hmm. but I didn't drop in on fast food restaurants at all. So it wasn't junk food. But I ate a lot, a lot of processed foods. Mm. And so I went to an or- organic, non-processed foods, no sugar, no gluten diet, basically. A little more complicated than that, but, uh, oh, no beef. Uh, just a little bit of organic uh, chicken and, uh, and fish, but not even all fish, because really large fish has mercury, so you have to eat fish that a little smaller that, mm-hmm. that don't gather mercury in their in their uh, body. Uh, so, in, 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 over a course of six months, uh, just going to that diet, uh, my numbers went down, and, and finally, at nine months, my doctor uh, my doctor didn't even bring me into the exam room on on one of my last visits to to that particular doctor. He called me into his office. I said, "Okay, this is different." And he said, look, I know I've asked you this a few times, but seriously, what are you doing? Oh, wow. And I told him the same answer, and he's like, okay, I don't, I don't get it, but okay. He said, um, you're in remission. I don't quite understand how, but um, congratulations, you're in remission. And that was, uh, that was about a little over four years ago. Mm. And uh, it all happened really through a holistic diet. Uh, my numbers did start to go up again. Uh, recently, and uh, I, uh, I ramped up what I did, um, and and still holistic. Still haven't done surgery, radiation. Uh, I have then uh, uh, started doing a hormonal chemotherapy, which is not a traditional chemotherapy where you lose all your hair, uh, but it is um, it is a hormonal chemotherapy that addresses uh, particularly addresses prostate cancer. And actually, it has a lot of estrogen in it. So if I start talking like this, then you'll know that that's <laughs> from the therapy that I'm presently on. Oh. Um, but still, no, no traditional Western medicine, and my my PSA has dropped a shocking number. What's um, PSA stand for? Uh, from thirteen um, to one point four. I've never had a PSA at one point four, and and that's like a really really low number for a man of my age. And what's PSA, Ivan? A uh, PSA it, it stands for prostate something antigen oh, okay. it's, it's a long uh, it. phrase something but uh, it's one of the one of the markers that the medical profession uses to determine whether there's something wrong with the prostate it. it doesn't guarantee that you have cancer or don't have cancer but as it goes up it's a huge flag and as it goes down it, they, they feel a lot more comfortable um, and it rarely goes down uh, unless unless you, there's an infection unless there's some temporary thing uh, so um, it, it, there are other tests and other things. MR, uh, there are uh, high definition uh, ultrasounds and MRIs that you can do, and I'm continuing to do that. And um, but I've done all of this pretty much through holistic means, um, and nobody was a bigger disbeliever than me. I think when this started. And today, uh, I'm listen. I'm, I'm not a medical doctor. I'm not giving anybody medical advice. I'm just simply sharing my story. That's right. And my story is uh, I was a total Western medicine guy, 
And now um, I have a different perspective on Western medicine. Um, one is, is Hippocrates. I mean, Hippocrates who's considered the father of Western medicine. Even he said, let food be thine medicine and medicine thine food. Yes. And yet Western medicine has forgotten that. Yeah. And um, uh, they are strictly into surgeries or primarily into surgeries and pharmaceutical uh, decisions. You know, most urologists who handle uh, prostate cancer are surgeons. That's what they do for a living. They're surgeons. Mm -hmm. So if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Mm. If if, if they see a problem, they want to go do surgery. Right. Because that's what they're trained in. And um, what I discovered for me... And, and, and I want to say this again, I'm not a medical doctor, but I tell you what, anyone who's been, who's been um, told they have a serious uh, disease, I believe they need to recognize that they are the captain of their ship. Yeah, Do goodness. not let anyone tell you or convince you what to do, you need to make that decision. And the best way to make that decision is to get as much information as possible, get as many opinions as possible. But then when push comes to shove, you've got to do what you want to do, what you think is best for you, not what somebody else tells you to do. And particularly medical doctors, they'll say, okay, you have this amount of time, you need to do this or that, and people do it. Yeah. And I think that's a mistake. I, I'm so excited right now. There are options. I think that's what we're what we're wanting to emphasize right now. There are options. And yep. what we are not saying, we are not placing blame. We are not saying that like doctors are bad. You know, like you just said, this is just your experience. What we're saying is I love what you just said about if you've only been given a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Is that what you said? Yeah. Yeah. If all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So right. if someone is trained in one particular thing, right. then that's what their expertise is and that's where they go to. And that totally makes sense. And that's why we have experts. We're so blessed right now, actually, yeah. that we have the opportunities in our culture, especially in America, to have, well, some some choice. And I think that Western medicine, as you said, is still the emphasized one, but more and more education and awareness is coming out around the other side of things that you're talking about, right. holistic healing or Eastern modalities. Acupuncture is now covered under some insurances, right? How amazing right. is that? And this is something that I just, oh, I get so crazy about is that there is no one right answer, right? So when it comes to anything in the healing realm, we really have to get clear about our unique situation, our unique body, what we're really feeling called to as part of our healing. If you're crazy afraid of needles, I'm probably not going to recommend you get acupuncture, (laughs) right? But there's, guess what? There's all kinds of other modalities that you can go utilize that incorporate body work. That's a huge part of healing, right? right? And then we talk about diet and just diet in general. Let's say that you're not even sick right? You're just trying to figure out how your body operates. Guess yep. what? You need to figure out how your body operates, period. Not what everybody else is doing. If your friend eats meat like crazy and that seems to work for them, that doesn't mean your body's going to like it, right? No, and, and you bring up a good point, though, with, uh, with, with going back to the diet issue. Uh, I, had a, I had a very interesting side effect from my change in diet. Uh, I dropped 45 pounds in three and a half months. Mm. Um, and I did nothing but change the kind of food that I ate. I had a friend who had surgery um, to um, to drop weight. Yeah, I lost weight faster than him. It's four years later. It's all still one hundred percent off. Yeah. he's back up to about eighty five percent of his original weight. Wow. Um, surgeries don't always do what you hope. They may do it temporarily, but uh, not not oftentimes not permanently. Yeah. Uh, so I have stuck to this, uh, you know, non-processed foods diet. Uh, Doctor, uh, 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 the book, uh, the, sh- the Blood Sugar Solution. Doctor Hyman um, has a great phrase that I really like: "Eat food that comes off of a plant, pointing at a tree, mm. not food that comes out of a plant, pointing at a building." Mm, mm. So you you know wow, you eat food yeah. that comes off of a tree, not food that comes out of a building. Yeah, and um, uh, and 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 that one primary change plus dropping sugar and gluten, uh, the weight I, I I was never hungry. I ate constantly, uh, and uh, the weight just fell off. Yeah, 
Yep. Your body realigned. Yeah. Right. And then also, so I'm, thank you. Thank you for letting us talk about this today too. Because yeah, my pleasure. And I've got a, I've got a website at the end of the show. Maybe um, I can throw it out there. Yeah. We're not selling anything. What I do is I just talk about uh, what I did and, and give resources for people to go to. What's just say, what's the website? Just say now. Uh, Meisner plan dot com perfect meisner plan dot com as a matter of fact the opening video is my wife and i uh at my lake house where i'm at right now Mm -hmm. perfect so i'm just so excited that we're talking about this because it really does connect back to uh, i keep bringing it back to uh, authenticity and individuality i talk a lot about individual truth on a lot of my shows for people that listen regularly and this is an, an area where that point remains when it comes to our health when it comes to our healing in any capacity whether we've had let's say some form of emotional trauma as a young child and it's still haunting us in our adulthood finding the right healer i talk about the match a lot right that right. research shows that the most critical component in benefiting from a therapeutic relationship of any kind whether it's a therapist, coach, etc., is simply the relationship. It's not the modality. It's not the year's experience. It's the relationship that helps promote healing. And I saw that growing up. I had three different therapists in my young adult, in my young tw- young twenties, early twenties, and two of them were amazing. And one of them was horrible, not because she was a bad therapist. It was because she was just a really poor match for me and where I was at in life. And I actually ran into her in the industry. We were kind of working in similar uh, industries a few years later. And she was great, but she just wasn't a good match for me the few years prior with what I was going through. And that really solidified for me that concept of the match. And we talked about this in building business relationships, the match, the connection, being authentic, letting it be okay that we're not going to get along with everyone. Well, now let's translate this over to what we're talking about now. Knowing that your body is a unique instrument, your body is a unique vessel, your health and your healing will be unique to your individual journey, right? And so understanding that just because you go to one expert who offers you one solution, that does not mean that is necessarily the answer for you. And this is the challenge that we are currently in is feeling like our options are limited and they don't have to be, right? More and more information is being brought to us on the internet, which of course it's hard to filter through that too sometimes, right? But being able to explore alternative methods and other options and and really allowing ourselves to do the research and be our own advocates, right? And really finding that authentic, true answer for ourselves and being open to knowing that there are other possibilities. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's really important. Uh, you got you to look at your op- options. Um, knowledge is power. The more information you get, the, it, it, and, and now I say this, and be prepared for one thing. It's also confusing. Yes. yes. Okay, you get all this information, you go, oh, my God, what do I do? Right. But now I'm, I'm more confused than ever, ever. Just keep looking over the information, talking to people. I found that there were times where I was completely confused because I got so much information. But that the, 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 the deeper that I went in that information, the more certain solutions seemed to rise in my mind. And, and in other cases, I, I spoke to men who had been uh, through prostate cancer, and it's really funny, I would say the majority of the ones I spoke to were fantastic for me, but for a reason that you would never guess. And that was, I listened to their story, I thought, okay, check that one off, there's no way I'm going to do that. <laughs> you know? I'm not kidding, almost every one, there was like one or two. So I thought, okay, this, let's pursue this. But almost every guy I spoke to was like, and they all had tried different things. I'm like, oh, there's no way I'm going to do that. That would be my last resort to do that. And, and so it, it not only tells you, doing the research not only helps you think about what to do, it helps you solidify in your mind what you don't want to do. That's right. That's right. And that actually brings me to another topic, yeah. or not another topic, but the concept of belief, too. <laughs> and sometimes like the, and I'm not saying that any of what we're talking about right now is the placebo effect, but the placebo effect is a phenomenon that really mystifies a lot of people because basically the concept is that you do something that's not supposed to work, but it does work because the person believed that it would work. Right. Right. How profound is that? And that's where it kind of comes back to, again, like the power of belief, the power of our mind, the power of what we kind of attach to and believe in and, and trust. And I think again, like you said, like, 
if it didn't feel right, you were like, nope, not doing that one. And good. I'm glad you didn't force yourself to, right? right. You, you kept searching until, and I like to bring things back to like maybe our intuition, our gut instinct, like, like, oh yeah, that feels right. Which is also how we often build authentic business relationships is like, oh yeah, I like that person. They feel right. Like I want to build a, a referral relationship with them or whatever. The same might go for other businesses big choices we're going to be making like i don't know our life partners or our yeah. business partners or hopefully our health choices right like so there's even a concept called like intuitive eating where you're really tuning in and listening to what your body's craving right and there's even things that tell you that you can research that if you're craving this your body might be low on this like our body is giving us messages all the time that's what is why yes. we're tuned in to do yes that's true but don't get uh, don't get uh, tricked right. because your body um the way particularly processed foods are made, yep. they're made to make your body crave things. That's right. So That's exactly what um, I was leading into. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, and and so you, you want to listen, but you want to also you want to listen not only with the uh, with the with your feelings, but with your head yep. at the same time. Yeah. Because there really are foods that 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 they're almost. I mean, they're not a drug. I don't want to compare it to a pharmaceutical. But they have some of the same kind of similarities uh, where they're, they're drawing you in and you crave that food. Oh, yeah. There's, and there's a whole, I mean, I was actually just pre presenting something on this last night around the issues that we have now with eating as a way of like emotional satisfaction, filling a void, how it's become a kind of a drug of its own. Right. The way that, emo that, excuse me, that chemicals are released in our brain when we're eating, especially for emotional satisfaction. Like this is a, a real deal thing. Right. Yeah. And then also sugar has a hormonal effect on us, right? I actually was just having a conversation with someone not that long ago about how we had to get really real about why he wasn't able to get off Pepsi and Snickers. And I'm like, well, let's talk about it. Everything we're doing is meeting a need. Everything we do is meeting a need. And yeah. I said, what need is this meeting? Like, what does it do for you? He said, honestly, Jen, he said, it gives me confidence. He said, that kick I get is the main thing that's helping me feel confident right now because he was struggling. And I'm like, you know what, if that's where we're at, like, let's validate that. What else can give you confidence? Let's have three tools. Let's hope that you use the first two and maybe not the pop so much. Right. Yep. But let's be real about it. Like, what need are you meeting by making the choices you're making right now? Right. right. For me, it was I was meeting the need of ease. Yeah. You know, it's easy. Yeah. Don't have to mess with it. Uh, you know, eating the way I am now really takes... Um, Sure. Uh, it, it, it takes thought. You got to really think about it. And uh, you know, when you when you run your own business, sometimes it's easy to get into uh, a decision fatigue. Yes. Where you know you just don't want to have to make any decisions. Let me just pop this uh, uh, lean cuisine in, sure. and uh, I'll eat that. Um, and so it, it, it's just it's a little more effort, but the results are are amazing. Well, in the flurry of busyness, right, and of stress, and I also we had mentioned a little bit, like you said that your life was a little a little extra stressful back then too when we were talking um before the show started today yeah way off the charts crazy stressful yeah and i mean how do you feel like that had a pretty strong correlation to developing some health challenges or your eating patterns or whatever well the eating patterns probably yes because it was just easier um to to uh, you know just pop something in a microwave and uh, rather than cook it sure um you know i used to joke that i i i, I couldn't cook i i would burn water and it's probably true. You know, I, I, I couldn't cook. <laughs> now, now I can at least get around a little bit in the kitchen. Right. Uh, luckily, I have a, a wife who is an amazing chef, so um, and she loves to cook. So most of the meals she does, um, and she's really the the architect behind the Meisner plan. Mm. Um, so yeah, I, I was under a lot of stress at, at, uh, a few years ago, and uh, less so now. And, th and that's a conscious decision to put myself in a position. Uh, where I'm in less stress. Yeah. Um, so that was that was a movement on purpose. Well, and we can, I'm really excited because Western medicine is really starting to embrace the concept that like, oh, wow, stress seems to be one of the causative factors in all kinds of diseases. How yeah. about that, right? Like it's yeah. really being validated. And our Western lifestyle has just heightened and heightened and heightened the amount of stress that we carry on a day-to-day -day basis where almost like if we're not under pressure or stress of some sort, it's almost uncomfortable. Right. Yes, stress and food, and of course, food could be you know, stress could be uh, you know a trigger, as you were saying, for food. But uh, definitely food. I mean, there's a uh, there's a study that was done a number of years ago called the China study, and one of the things they looked at was that men in most of Asia, in much of Asia, uh, prostate cancer is almost unheard of. 
Oh. It is extremely rare. Wow. And they looked into the diet, and the diet of, of, of most Asians, particularly in China, uh, was, uh, you know, a very uh, high vegetarian, uh, low meats of fish, and, um, uh, and, and and that's one of the reasons that they believed um, that there was a very low rate of uh, prostate cancer. Similar with the Mediter- Mediterranean diet. I, I particularly like the Mediterranean diet because there's always a little red wine included. <laughs> Let's be honest. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So I think that as we try to kind of wrap up and summarize what we've talked about today, I feel like one of the biggest messages I'm really hearing is, again, coming back to a really deep-seated, authentic standpoint when it comes to relationships, when it comes to health, when it comes to business development. Like, I feel like we are, and the fact that our culture is craving love, right? And love, I believe, is built from an authentic place, right? Like, (laughs) you might really like someone for a little bit, but if you're faking it, it's not going to last that long. No. And this is where I'm just so excited to hear that authenticity really is critical, but where do we start? You know, like so many people, when I ask people in, in my coaching business, what makes you happy and what do you want? I can't tell you, Ivan, how many blank stares I get. Like people have gotten so disconnected to that really deep seated, authentic truth for themselves. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, do you have, do you have any tips on, on that? Well, look, you know, I think, I think a lot of people uh, look at what they would like their life to be. It's not where it is. And so they feel disappointed or uh, dejected. Uh, and, and then don't take action to get there. I think a lot of where you want to go in life, uh, in, including your values, you may look at your values and you go, I value this, but I'm, but I'm not living that to the extent I would like to. Yeah. And so the first thing I would do is I'd say, forgive yourself and recognize that values can be aspirational. Yeah. That, you, you know, if you set that intention that this is the person I want to be, um, then you're much more likely to achieve that. Mm. And, 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 and it's okay to be aspirational, aspirational, but then take action Yes, to yes. do that. You know, I'm, yes. I'm a real believer in the law of attraction, but the word action is part of the word attraction. <laughs> you have to take action. It's not just a matter of attraction. That's right. So you set that intention and then take action to achieve that intention. And, and you take action understanding that it can be aspirational goals. You know, I'm not there yet. I'm not that person that I'd like to be. I haven't quite achieved what I want. But I can be there, and these are my action steps to get there. That's right. And then do it. And then do it. <laughs> and then do it. I mean, Nike's got it right. Just do it. Yeah. Uh, you know, I tell business people, I see this all the time. They tell me, what's this, really, what's the secret to being successful in business? You know, you, you know networking, but you've built a company with 7,700 locations in 73 countries. How do you do that? Yeah. And I tell them probably the biggest lesson and, and the biggest mistake that most businesses make is it relates to, to repeating uh, what they're doing. It's better to do six things a thousand times than to do a thousand things six times. Mm. And what most business people do is a thousand things six times. Mm -hmm. Instead, you take a handful of things. It doesn't have to be six. It could be five. It could be seven. You take a a handful of things, and you do it consistently over and over and over again. And that's what I mean by taking action with aspirational goals. Uh, You you know, you you look to that, and then you do six things a thousand times to achieve it. And you'll achieve it. You'll feel pretty good about yourself afterwards. That's right. Actually, you feel pretty good about yourself along the way. Yeah. And great about yourself afterwards. Well, and what I want to add to that is we sometimes get so paralyzed in fear because we can't see. Is it Who is it that says that? Is it Martin Luther King Jr.? Where don't worry about seeing the whole staircase. Just take the first step. Yeah. Right? And I talk about that a lot where it's like all we need to do is keep taking the right next step. And I typically connect it back to like trusting your gut, really following the guidance that you feel like you're receiving. Right? But the most important part is like, yes, when you know that you want to become a certain type of person or you want to make some really significant life changes, first, we need to understand how change works and how the brain actually can try to sabotage us a little bit because of how we call it the critter brain in a coaching program I was in. I loved that because the point of the critter brain is to keep us safe. 
to keep us in our comfort zone is a survival mechanism. Right. And it kicks on when we start to step out of that. And so being able to work and comfort that part of ourselves, like, hey, I appreciate you wanting to keep me safe, but I'm actually going to step forward and we're okay. And working with ourselves, working with our brain, working with our energy to help it understand that like we're growing and we're expanding right. because and, we're choosing and to. And we're you brain. can retrain your brain. A That's really good right. friend of mine is uh, Dr. Daniel Amen, who's a brain scientist, neuro, uh, neuroscientist. Yeah. And it's one of the things he talks about is that you can retrain your brain. That's right. Um, and he learned that many years ago. And, and he, had a, he, he tells a story about how um, he, he did a brain scan on himself and, and his brain was problematic. Mm. And he did a brain scan on his mother, who was 20 or 30 years older. And it was beautiful. Wow. And, and he worked for years to do the things that he learned would help make a healthier brain. Yeah. And he's very proud to say that he has a brain now, 30 years later, that's healthier and younger looking in a scan than it was 30 years before. His point being, you can, you can train your brain to do a lot of amazing things. That's right. That's right. And, but the thing is, guess what? Sorry, guys. Me and Ivan aren't here telling you that there's some magical solution. I mean, we love the concept of magic, of course, but <laughs> there, we, there's not just like, hey, do no. this one thing and your whole life is going to be fixed and perfect. No. Like, no I, hey, listen, though, I, I've got the secret to success. You want to yeah. hear it? Yes. The secret to success without hard work is still a secret. Yep, that's right. <laughs> you gotta, if there's work to do, boys and girls. You, you got you to gotta do the work and you do the work and amazing things can happen. But when we're really aligned and, again, in our authentic individual truth and really following our paths, that work gets a lot more fun and a lot easier. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay, Ivan, man, we've covered a lot of ground. So, Hey, do you think think your favorite listener uh, enjoyed this, Cynthia? uh, Oh, I do. I do. I think so. I actually, if I look at my phone right now, uh, she's a – oh, you had her in tears, actually, it looks like at one point. Good job, Ivan. (laughs) Hopefully we did that. We do that for a few more people in the future. <laughs> well, hopefully, the hopefully happy tears. <laughs> oh yeah. Not. Oh, yeah. oh my gosh, what kind of guest did you bring on today? No, no. I think Kick it's because it. this is. But like I said, Ivan, people are craving this. Like they're craving. Yeah. We need this to be incorporated more into the the mainstream realm too of business of like authenticity, really getting clear, really allowing yourself to make choices that are for your highest good, for your health, for your development, for your business, for your family, right? Really allowing yourself to get really clear and really aligned with what is right and true for you. Doing the research, making the choices and allowing yourself to step a little bit out of your comfort zone just like you did and look what happened within nine months, right? And I think that's really where... I want to drive it home is uh, the biggest message that I hear coming out of this really funnels down to, again, the simple word of authenticity, right? That what do networking and health have in common? Being authentic in both, <laughs> right? And in life. No, in no life. doubt about it. That's right. And getting clear, like, who are you? What do you want? Keep asking that question and get clear and allow yourself to get clear because we don't all want the same things. You know, I like to go pet trees and play with crystals sometimes and go on adventures in the woods. Not everybody's into that and they don't have to be. They might want to go run a marathon and I think that's crazy. So (laughs) it's like what makes us happy? What serves our heart? What really is part of who we are? And that's what's going to help us get clear and keep stepping forward into a more authentic space, which then naturally benefits every area of our lives. So there's my, there's my soapbox. And Ivan, I want to ask if you had to shout one thing to the world right now, what would it be for you? Oh, uh, it would be that you may not be able to live a life of balance, but you can live a life of harmony. Mm. And that's a whole show right there. That's right. <laughs> hey, I'd love to be able to give people uh, my website. Please, uh, yes, we that up. was my oh. next question. You're such a mind reader. Thank you. I am. Uh, if, if you're interested in BNI, go to BNI.com. It stands for Business Network International, BNI.com. <clears throat> I have a blog. IvanMeisner.com. If you go there uh, today, I have an interview with uh, John Maxwell, the leadership guy. And, of course, uh, we talked about uh, uh, IvanMeisner.com, and then we talked about um, uh, the Meisner plan. If you uh, if you have some health issues and you want to see what we did, uh, go there. Thanks. Get some education, right? Explore. Thank you. Thank you for making the time. Thank you for having a phone available. <laughs> Yeah, there's an inside joke there. Yeah. <laughs> and just thank you for how you're really serving so many people with really staying clear and attached to your vision and what you see 
your people needed, right? And being authentic to yourself because that's what's allowed so many people to start stepping forward for themselves. Well, thanks, Jen. You you do a great interview. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Excellent. And, and I've done quite a few, so you're oh. good. <laughs> Hooray. Perfect. And I want to also say thank you all for listening to Information and Inspiration with Jen Julius. For more information about me and to check out some previously recorded shows, you can go to jenjulius.com or you can also check out my Facebook page at facebook.com slash Coaching. Thank you so much for listening and take care. <laughs>